So Clara's an MA curating. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. the second year of the MFA curating course at Goldsmiths. Uh, even if it feels like the first one, because last year was quite <laughs> difficult. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you were as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Had to, yeah. <laughs> and I already had the pleasure to talk to Katarina because we organized a workshop about um, curating research. And that day we were exploring like research in the context of PhD courses and the academic context. And then she invited me to this presentation. So I'm really happy I already saw the the videos. <laughs> yeah. I think some people may not have seen it yet, so we're gonna have a showing after this as well. Mm -hmm. One more round, uh, if if you want to watch them. Yeah. And um do you think we should just start? I have a. Yeah. I would like, first of all, to ask you about this mm -hmm. letter you wrote mm -hmm. and the dominant character. I think it's interesting. I don't know if it's supposed to be you as you sometimes write your habitual self, this dominant character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a character that is predominant over the others. Or you can tell me, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I called this whole. I mean, uh, I've made this installation in dialogue with another PhD student who's mm -hmm. showing downstairs, and we kind of called what we're doing together a fluid kind of logic. Mm -hmm. But my part, as you're saying, is called a letter to the dominant character. Mm -hmm. And that might sound a bit weird for people who haven't seen any of my work, so I will just say what you'll see later is a series of really short films, some of them quite silly, uh, usually quite light-hearted, where I'm playing different characters. So that's what I mean by character. I'm literally playing different personas or characters. Uh, mm -hmm. Often they have different accents, different bodily gestures, they wear different things, and they hopefully seem like different people. And as you're saying, I mean, I have given a name mm -hmm. to the dominant character, mm -hmm. which as you're saying, is kind of what I imagine to be the more habitual character, the character that you put on mm -hmm. every day that meets the world, kind of who I am right now. Mm -hmm. So this is one of my dominant characters. So yeah, yeah. My, my work suggests that we are always in character. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess also during our conversation, the previous conversation we had, I asked you if, how do you feel to write about your writing in the context of the PhD and you told me that is something that in a way, there's always a character that you're playing. So yeah. even when you are here talking to us, you're still, in a way, playing a character mm -hmm. that might be, might be, yes, a dominant character. So, mm -hmm. but you still think that, in a way, you're still, in a way, acting and playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's something that is also in your video suburbia. You're saying about this, talking about this idea of always being on a stage. Mm -hmm. and realizing that in a way we are always mm -hmm. on a stage and that also made me think about like from my academic background like in Italy like Pirandello and the idea of looking into the mirror and seeing realizing that you're not just one but you are many people and in a way that ended up going crazy but I guess for you it's more a way of accepting also this multiplicity and uh, yeah. playing with it Right? I don't know. Exactly. I think um, maybe the sort of work I'm making at the moment is a, is a response to, to feeling like I never can very easily categorize myself mm -hmm. into neat identity categories. Mm -hmm. So as I was speaking to some of you before, if I'm in different social contexts, I'll put on a different, slightly unconsciously, of course, like change mm -hmm. my voice or my behaviors. And so I'm interested in how, uh, and there's evidence for this, that um, especially in Western cultures, mm -hmm. there's not a very high tolerance for people who are inconsistent, who mm -hmm. change. And there's a lot of like psychological evidence that people are perceived as less trustworthy if they're seen to change their accent with, or like to frame switch. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's like a social disadvantage to be somebody who is fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, and I wonder if that could change one day, and we might not think about people as having very fixed identities, but maybe we 
we start to develop ways to be comfortable in culture with mm -hmm. having multiple identities. And what you're, so, so people often link my work to kind of disabilities or like, mm -hmm. uh, like schizophrenia, like having something, an affliction mm -hmm. and, and struggling with multiple characters. But I think it's something we all do in a way. Like mm -hmm. when you talk to yourself, when you're doing a task, mm -hmm. I think it's quite natural actually to have internal dialogues, to have different parts of yourself in conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it's something I realized, especially when I moved from one country to another. Mm -hmm. Every time I'm speaking in English, I feel like in a way I'm acting anyway. Even if yeah. I'm being myself now, I know that I'm not exactly like playing myself as I would in Italy, for example, because it's, I mean, even just speaking in another language yeah. makes me realize this kind of, yeah. Exactly, and I have a question then for you. Do you feel like you're discovering a new Clara in English? Yeah, I think so. I already had the same feeling even just when I moved from one city to another in Italy, and it was already like, I, I had this kind of feeling in a way when I moved from Rome to Milan and in Milan I was also like trying since I have a strong Roman accent I was also trying to kind of mitigate that accent even unconsciously at the beginning then I started playing with it so yeah I think you also discovered new like characters in a way inside yourself as well so yeah and you also mentioned the fact that you are as a multicultural person, as someone moving, mm -hmm. this is more, this is something you feel stronger, like, or at least that you can actually understand in a way, it's more in front of your eyes rather than right. when you are, yeah. Yeah, so, um, not when I, because I've been doing this kind of practice of playing different characters mm -hmm. for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, it started when I was a teenager, and that's precisely that age where you're trying to discover your who you are, yeah. uh, and I was having this problem, genuinely, I was worried that I was being fake, mm -hmm. because I was like, I'm Serbian, and I grew up in Northern England, and then I grew up in Norway for the rest of my like teenage life, so I felt very much in between these quite different mm -hmm. nationalities, cultures, and um, I, I noticed that Sometimes I'd be in a situation where someone would notice that I'm different mm -hmm. and they would say, are you faking that accent? Mm -hmm. You know, and then it made me feel like, oh my gosh, am I? Um, is, and I, I questioned authenticity. So, or this is a big theme in the work is how do we, what do we feel is authentic? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, so then that leads me to I mean, there's loads of research about this in cultural psychology, mm -hmm. about frame switching, that people, ha um, uh, they call them multiculturals in, in that literature, that they frame switch, that they switch their personality, their beliefs, their outward behaviours, depending on who they're talking to. Mm -hmm. And this is very conspicuous in bilingual people, or people who have migrated between countries, but if you, but who's really a monocultural? Mm -hmm. Is that you know they do have this word in that literature. No one's really has one. So I bet we're all really negotiating. But maybe it's particularly like visible in language. Maybe we're particularly sensitive yeah. to like national identities. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and also the fact that you act in a way differently in considering who you have in front of you that is not necessarily seen as, as you say, inconsistency but it's, it's also like a matter of, yeah, of context and there's another movie that this made me think about that is uh, Zelly by Woody Allen. I keep getting recommended this and I haven't yeah, seen it Yeah, I think it's like this, the leading character like keeps changing and keeps speaking also different languages depending on the person that is speaking to and yeah. So it's something I was thinking about when watching also the video. Also in, so in the last video, or maybe now it's not anymore, it's not the last one anymore, but mm -hmm. um, the ta time off, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it, you also change a bit your accent, I mean... Jury. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, 
one thing to acknowledge is I'm definitely not an actor. <laughs> with with uh, and I think the way I approach accents mm. is um, I don't like do an accent. Like I don't do a French accent or a Italian accent. I kind of just change my voice until it arrives. That's I feel like I know this person. Mm -hmm. Like this person feels familiar. And you know, in real life, people don't necessarily have a very stereotypical mm -hmm. French accent, or um, they often have moved in different places, and the accents mingle. Mm -hmm. Like uh, coming from Scan having grown up in Scandinavia, I really like meeting, for example, Norwegian people who now live in Scotland, and I like the way those two <laughs> accents <laughs> cross. Yeah. Um, so I approach it in that way that maybe I'm not trying to be a faithful accent crafts person. Mm -hmm. I just try and arrive at some voice that I feel is familiar. Mm -hmm. And it can oscillate a bit during the performance. I, sp I might become someone slightly different. But you never record. I, that's something. It's not scripted. Like It's not pre-written, like what you're performing yeah. in a way. It's always improvisation it's that right yeah. so you don't like for example I don't know if it happens that you during one of this video you just decide to start again or like yeah start from scratch or mm -hmm. something that you just keep going like with the I would say with the flow or that's a good question yeah I it's changed throughout my practice in the very beginning uh, I was interested in storytelling and I gave myself the challenge can you sit there and tell a story from scratch mm -hmm. without stopping? And I was less good at it then, so I would stop and, oh, I don't know where to go next with this story that I'm improvising. So I would just sit there in silence and then start again. Mm -hmm. Now I've gotten better at it, so I can almost just in a, I can just start and run with something mm -hmm. and usually keep it fairly seem like it was premeditated for... Mm -hmm at least five minutes usually, um, so it's not scripted, um, but, and the only editing I do usually, so I do a long, I do a long like recording and then I'll take out a snippet, mm -hmm. um, so the editing so it's even is, longer than, I mean it's, yeah, so I might have parts that were actually a bit like, mm, I didn't, as you say, I didn't find the right person, mm -hmm. so I try again, so sometimes it can check, it's like tuning a radio. Mm -hmm. As I'm changing my voice, it's like mm, finding the right register, and then I, when I find it, it, it lands, and I. It's yeah. usually I'm very curious about what this person would say. Mm -hmm. yeah, this voice I found. And like you're also a writer, so you, you're also mm -hmm. writing a novel. Yeah, yeah. And what for you? What's the difference between like? I don't know if it's because of the immediacy of, as you say, performing and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, taking a record or video record of your perform your performance, or and what's the difference with the, when you write about mm. your characters rather than when you just play them out? You know, with that's a great question. I've yeah, I've always loved writing, and I see the videos as an oral writing. Mm -hmm. It's also writing. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm a storyteller basically, and then I write stories either through improvisation or novel writing or short stories or plays, so yeah, I love writing, but you, they are quite different. I notice, for example, I can't write a novel and work on my performance practice at the same time. Mm -hmm. They seem really, they do seem really different, but my novel is also kind of exploring some similar themes. Mm -hmm. So my novel, uh, my, <laughs> my novel is called Anomaly, mm -hmm. and it's about a character a fictional character who has no personality at the start of the book. And I tried to imagine, what is it like to have zero personality? So to me, I think that would be someone who's really impressionable, like a, like a baby. Mm -hmm. You know, a baby, the first thing it sees is going to shape it. Mm -hmm. So I take this zero personality character and I invent this world, which kind of looks like a cliche Jane Eyre, mm -hmm. um, Bronte novel, mm -hmm. I put the character in there and see what happens. Mm -hmm. It's almost, I imagine it like watching a bacteria in a petri dish. Okay. So you can see how it explores similar themes of like how the environment is shaping the person. Yeah. 
and uh, this character of mine is born in a library mm -hmm. and so that has significance as well because there's all these books with all the history mm -hmm. of all the stories we've told <coughs> and how they shape her mm -hmm. and she becomes you know she ends up having a, a, a gender she's a she mm -hmm. but that's something she acquires yeah. through being affected by literature mm -hmm. and she ends up having a personality uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a, again, an experiment in mm -hmm. watching the shaping of identity. I guess all your characters are shaped by context in a way, and that's also going back to the idea of inauthenticity. I mean, to me, I also I curated an exhibition called Praise to Incoherence and Chameleonism, so probably, I mean, I actually relate to what you're doing. So, but to me, it's crazy, like, especially now in contemporary society, thinking about coherence as a plus mm -hmm. rather than, since we're surrounded by different stimuli and situations that in a way necessarily changed ourselves and are asked us to behave differently given the context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, in a way, it's the context always shapes different characters and different parts of, our, of ourselves. As we, we, uh, yeah. And do you think coherence then can be a form of violence that you sort of inflict on yourself, like having to try and stay this like coherent? Yeah, I think I think so. Honestly, like growing growing up is something you really like try to in a way to understand about yourself, as you say, as you were saying about your teenager years. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was struggling with it, like mm -hmm. even just dressing completely different from one day to the other, or having different ideas or hobbies from one day to the other. It felt yeah. weird, and now it's something I'm embracing much more than yeah. in the past because it's something you are, in a way, I'm accepting, and I I see it as a um, as something positive, not negative necessarily. And so yeah, but I had the same thing. Like uh, I would, I would go to high school really yeah. dolled up, like really girly, mm -hmm. and I, I, I had that phase of like dressing like I was from the sixties. <laughs> and then the next day, I came in like I really wanted to play basketball. Yeah. And then I would come in like sneak because, and I remember that moment thinking, mm -hmm. oh, but are people gonna perceive like wonder why am I dressed like this? It doesn't match. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, you know, if you break that barrier, it's m very liberating. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Do you always another thing about your performances? You are always aware that you have an audience, that you are talking to someone. Mm -hmm. It's not like talking to yourself necessarily. I mean, mm. your characters always refer to an audience, mm -hmm. and they like talk about this. Uh, predominant character always quite even just in a way that is like as they are I don't know they mention this predominant character and they also refer to the audience to tell them what's happening with this other characters I don't know if they also refer to other characters or is mm -hmm. more about the predominant the dominant one because mm -hmm. I know this, they talk about the dominant character quite a quite a lot. Mm -hmm. As if yeah, yeah. Um, remind me. The first part was about uh, uh, what did you notice again? We just left my that mind. you always have an audience when that you're performing. That was the audience thing. Yeah, thanks I, I, for that question because I, I still actually sort of struggle to understand who am I talking to. So mm -hmm. when you watch the videos, it looks like I'm. It kind of looks like a YouTuber to me, actually. Mm -hmm. I think I'm picking up the language of vlogging sometimes. Yeah, you know? so like when you record yourself yeah. on the beach, just walking. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting relationship with an audience, isn't it? Because it's almost like a diary mm -hmm. and inward looking, but at the same time, it's broadcast. Yeah, because you don't even know who you're talking to in the end, even with social networks, you're like mm. talking, but not, yeah. I think, I think I like to think that I am actually performing for myself, mm -hmm. but it's weird that I actually need the helper of the camera, mm -hmm. and the camera is like this eye that's looking at me, and um, I find I get more into the trance of performance when the camera's there, mm -hmm. because 
I feel like maybe that's my stand-in audience because I usually actually don't, I've tried and I haven't really cracked it yet with live performance. Like if I were to try and go into character now, mm -hmm. A, it would really scare me and B, um, I think it's, I haven't really cracked how to have that intimacy with myself okay. that I can when I'm in private. And I can really go experimental then because I'm not afraid of failing. And, mm -hmm. um, but then I need that camera there to act as a witness. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like when the camera's there, I can see myself through this other perspective and that allows me to change my persona. Because I'm see watching Just, myself become different. Okay, this is like you understand that in that moment you are performing in a way. You are like in front of on a stage. It's like as if the stage becomes real in a way, mm -hmm. knowing that I don't know. If, yeah. Yeah. And you, are there many characters like when they come up, you don't agree with them, yeah. or are you struggling sometimes with your own characters, or? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> That was when things started to get quite interesting for me, when I was starting to get surprised by the things my character said. And yeah, I mean, there is one character that's like, wants to be a dictator, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's one video where the character's literally arguing that catastrophes can be a good thing in the long term. Like, obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, uh, like, like extinctions, I mean it's horrible, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would never go on saying that, but it was nice in the, in the, in the kind of laboratory of the practice to run with this, this thought and imagine mm -hmm. sympathizing. And then uh, when I finish the character, I do snap out of it, um, um, and then I watch back and I'm like, what did I say there, you know? Uh, nothing has been too sort of outrageous, you can tell it's a kind of mm -hmm. speculative thing I'm doing. It's not me voicing a real opinion. It's running. I, I'm starting to think. You know, I've called this whole thing a uh, dominant letter to the dominant character. Mm -hmm. I am actually starting to question whether to call myself who I am now, dominant, mm -hmm. and these guys that you will watch later, subordinate. I'm starting to question that already. Um, I'm starting to think that these you may call fictional characters that you. you watch later are like tangential characters mm -hmm. they're like one character take you you enter that position and then you just run with it and see where it goes and um, there's like quite I think I'm quite strict with myself when I'm performing to stay stay in it mm -hmm. no matter what you're saying just stay in it see where it goes and it does end up surprising me, I say things. Yeah, I once, for example, inhabited a character who really propounds like alternative medicine mm -hmm. um, and like I in my real life, let's say, uh, I'm a very sort of scientific person and mm -hmm. don't do alternative medicine. But when I was in that character, I really sort of, that's why I don't actually call my work parody Mm -hmm. I don't think it is parodic. I think there is actually em empathy, actually, uh, for mm -hmm. all the characters that we have it. And what did you... You said to me that this video was supposed to be like um, words on, on their own. I mean, not yeah. supposed to be screened necessarily one after the other, but then you decided to do this screening and present presenting all these video, specific videos, because I know there are more. Mm -hmm. like, I saw many. <laughs> And why you choose this specific, like, also you change the order. I don't know if in you think there is a sort of mm -hmm. narrative that you can, like, delineate by, for, for example, let one character speak after another, or, yeah. So um, this is where it's good to have, like, a dialogue with a curator, actually, because I'd be interested in mm. what you would actually choose if you were to kind of curate an evening like this. but. For me, it was quite simply, these are the most recent works I've made, mm -hmm. and that's why some of them have some similarities, because I'm going through a phase right now with certain interests, mm -hmm. and five years ago I would have made quite, you would see some different preoccupations. Um, mm -hmm. But I did change the order, you're right. Um, so before the, I thought to, 
I just tried to organize the order so the characters are as different as possible to each other. Okay. And then I changed my mind and now we're starting with the most energetic character. Okay. Like, and quite silly. And then it slowly gets lower, lower energy. That's how I sort of thought about it. So you'll start with something quite light mm -hmm. and it will sort of grow dimmer in a way. Okay. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, obviously, if you have any questions, I saw it in yeah. writing down things. Feel free to yeah. ask Katharina's question. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I can keep going, I think, forever. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would like to ask a question because I'm still very interesting, fascinated by your like, the, the input and output, how you pick up those characters mm -hmm. in the and, and the surrounding. And so you mentioned that you you will sometimes you be surprised what you mm -hmm. say when when you are in different character, um, and and you still uh, tell yourself to stay and and keep going on, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. keep saying things. So, uh, so you you're always like all the character coexist in your in yourself. I, I don't think it's a stage or a performance at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's just like you're in a in a flow very mm -hmm. naturally and, and unconsciously. Yeah. I think that is really fascinating. Yeah. I would like to know how you do the because I, I never really think into your work yet. Um, so I would like to know how, how you wind it you you firstly wind it down and then improvise it. No yeah, writing yeah. at all. No writing at all. Yeah. So totally verbal. Yeah. Something so happens to me, I just get this tickly feeling like, oh, I really feel like, um, I feel, actually I have a word for it in my practice, it's called jealousy. But I have a very particular idea of feeling jealous. So I feel jealous of characters and I might actually, so, so it's, it's some kind of, irresistible admiration I feel for something and I need to copy it. Uh. Just like, you know, when uh, kids like go and watch a martial arts film and then they come out of the film like, <laughs> you know, so they can't stop yeah. moving and like, it's like they, they catch the bug. Mm. Uh, I feel like that all the time. With uh. people I meet, I catch the bug of that person and oh, I wish for a moment I could be a bit like that, you know regardless of like the race or the gender or the background of mm -hmm. the person there there might be some little quality in their voice or what they're doing with their hands that I wish I was doing and then I allow myself that indulgence in the practice basically but the surprise was that it in turn informs my thought process that copying someone's hand gestures can actually start to change how I think. <laughs> yeah, that was a surprise to me. But the process is, um, yeah, no writing. Um, often people affect me, but actually the room as well. Mm -hmm. So, because I'm often even also looking at myself while I'm in character, mm -hmm. I see the space around me and I think, oh, this looks like it could be an office. So maybe I'm in an office or, or maybe, I'm in a spaceship, or, or when I, one of the scene, one of the stories is in a kitchen, mm -hmm. and it was literally I was cooking, and I had felt started to feel the jealousy. Was it real? The sound from upstairs, like yeah, it was real. Oh my <laughs> god, I totally relate to that. I have to that. <laughs> but actually, yeah. it was my boyfriend. Oh, okay. um, was, I wasn't oh. actually angry at him. I was angry at something else. Okay, this will so make more sense if you <laughs> see the video. Because I was like, oh, that's. I mean, worse than my yeah. actually <laughs> so neighbors. I think, I was <laughs> but it's relevant actually to this because I was being affected by what was happening. Mm -hmm. So I was hearing this noise, and mm -hmm. I thought, uh, and it's actually really useful because then your performances can't be ruined by anything. Nothing can happen to destroy your performance. If someone walks in and like bombs your mm -hmm. <laughs> your yeah, film, you can use it. Like you just respond as your character would respond. But you don't define yourself as an actor, in a way. You, yeah. you wouldn't, you said, I'm not good at acting. Yeah, that's, yeah. I don't know, it's like, I would really love to try and play other characters because it's something I already actually do mm. in my everyday life, in a way. Mm. But still, 
doing it in front of a camera would require to me for me to have a more mm, conscious like capacity in performing or acting in a way. I'm not so sure I'd be able to perform in front of a camera with someone else behind that yeah. camera. <laughs> um, but maybe I would, I don't know. When I make a, mm -hmm. a distinction between myself, uh, what I'm doing and acting, kind of what you were saying, it's a kind of stream of consciousness, sort of. Yeah. I'm actually in some kind of trance. I'm actually mm -hmm. being that way for a while. Um, and I, I think the difference is this, I've thought about it. Mm -hmm. I think actors are in the business of representing something. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have this image and they're trying to re-present that image to the audience. Uh, whereas I don't think I'm representing anything. Mm -hmm. So for example, I don't have a target image. Instead, uh, the character I'm acting is actually in development as the video is going. And it's it rather than it being an act of representation, it's more like a uh, exploration mm -hmm. of my I call it my personality bandwidth, like mm -hmm. my spectrum and exploration mm -hmm. of that. And it's interesting that in a way you find it useful also because you define it a collaboration with yourself mm -hmm. and also you were, I, I read you talked about role play as also helpful for <coughs> thinking as something that is productive in a way. Well, I'm, I'm toying with that idea. I don't know what you think, but I, uh, that's just something I'm... I sometimes think... When I was younger, I used to think, oh, this, this skill I'm practicing would be really good mm -hmm. at, like, cop like, you know, at UN conferences or something, if you could <laughs> sit in the different positions for a while, mm -hmm. uh, it would be really good in diplomacy mm -hmm. or something. So I started one, I, I call it a kind of empathy practice. Mm -hmm. um, I, if, I don't know, maybe that's not the right term, but that it feels like, yeah, inhabiting a position for a while. Like, what if the person in front of you would do the same, like... You could get something, and at the same time, I mean, what will be the character played in that occasion? Ah, you think if I try performing like this with somebody around, or...? Like if someone else is mm, performing this kind of empathy and, like, understanding... Uh, I, mean, I mean, if it was... I don't know how to explain Do you mean it. maybe if I taught somebody else the pra the method of doing what I'm doing? Do you mean like if I ask someone You said you're me? really influenced also by um, the small details also of oh, the person yeah. you're talking to. Yeah. So you, in a way, get something from it. And if the other person d could do the same with you, that... You w I wouldn't call it like an exchange or kind of... But there's something... I don't know, it I think would be so. interesting, and also I know that you try to have a, com you had a conversation, two of your characters mm. had a conversation, if I'm not wrong, or a dominant character with a secondary character. I that's don't right, know. yeah. Um, actually, that's a new experiment in my practice, I never mm. did that before, and I have only done it once. I've done a few tries, basically what it is, is I play different so normally as you'll see in these videos I'm just one character in the video um, but then I tried this experiment like what if I um, for, I'm talking to mm -hmm. a space next to me mm -hmm. in this character and then I move over here and then I answer in a different character which mm -hmm. is like playing with dolls you know when you kind of play the two parts mm -hmm. and you're right one of the characters was mm -hmm. more like the me that I'm being now let's say the dominant Mm -hmm. character and the other one was somebody who I've never really been before and I was surprised because that character started accusing me of being quite overbearing and dominating mm -hmm. and I never thought of that before and it opened up this idea that maybe there's a, a politics of in inner self as well as politics between people mm -hmm. and I wondered I mean this is all speculative I, I could be on a wrong track here, but I wondered, is that a kind of violence to myself then, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. not, to silence certain parts of me? Well, it's just mm -hmm. an idea I'm working with, you know. Okay. Um, 
and also I'm interested in the distributed itself. You mentioned this distributed self and the time-based person. Mm -hmm. I guess this relates to what we were talking about, but why distributed? Like, so uh, as as with this growing interest I have in mm -hmm. how we think about what a, a self is, mm -hmm. uh, I've looked out and looked at some other theories. So a really classic model we have for what a person is is imagining like a vessel mm -hmm. with something inside, like a shell with the soul inside. That's like one way we imagine a person. So if you look at another person, you see like um, there's something hidden inside of them. And I think that's um, mm -hmm. one, we, we could call that the vessel model. Mm -hmm. And then I came across what uh, some anthropologists mm -hmm. were thinking about, they were studying um, some uh, societies um, where actually, um, yeah, it comes from the part of anthropology that's really interested in gift economies, mm -hmm. like giving gifts, and how in some societies the gift is really strongly attached to that person. It's almost like the person is in the object. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when anthropologists started talking about the distributed person, which is this idea of a self that doesn't stop at the border of the skin. Mm -hmm. So my Facebook account, my shoes, my laundry, um, the footprints I left on the grass when I walked here this morning, all that is this ephemera, this material, mm -hmm. traces, they're all also mm -hmm. part of the person. But there's also a more profound way to think about it, that, for example, there's a part of me that's in you, mm -hmm. and there's a part of you that's kind of in me, and um, that, that I can't be a self without you. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, one of the novels I really love by Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway, mm -hmm. I think is, is actually an experiment in giving a portrait mm -hmm. through this distributed person model. So Mrs. Dalloway, you can guess it's about Mrs. Dalloway, but it's like a portrait of this woman. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't feature that much in the novel. We, sometimes she does. But we really get to know her through all the people that are connected to her. So I think Virginia Woolf was playing with the idea of giving a portrait of someone through the people that are like faintly connected to that person, rather than trying to outline what that person looks like, what their character's like. It was actually almost like seeing Mrs. Dalloway's ghost Mm -hmm. in the city and of London yeah, and all these other people. Mm -hmm. That's a distributed person. And it were, in a way it reminds me of, you said you're writing a novel about this character with no um, character in a way. Yeah. And so yeah, and it's shaped in a way by, in Mrs. Dalloway, she's like kind of mm, created in a way as a character by the people surrounding her, by the environment surrounding her. And it reminds me of what you said, you're writing also about your novel. And uh, mm -hmm. there is also uh, the landscape, that thing's also really mm. interested me, like the landscape by Cezanne, I guess it was. Yeah. Yes, and um, now I don't precisely remember, but basically uh, you were writing that this landscape that the um, that Cezanne was painting was in a way uh, could think itself just in the painting, like, could, yeah. I can, I can could quote it, I remember that line because it's mm -hmm. quite important mm -hmm. to me. So Cezanne apparently said in some interview, I don't have the original reference, but mm -hmm. he apparently said about his paintings, the landscape thinks itself through me and I am its consciousness. So he, um, and you can kind of see it in his painting as well. I, I almost imagine uh, Cezanne like a, a seismograph, you know, this instrument that measures earthquakes, and that the landscape is actually gaining some agency mm -hmm. through him. And his painting approach is all about becoming a kind of medium for the landscape. Mm -hmm. So I, he gives his consciousness to landscape, and I think that's a lovely... Mm -hmm. way and, and I started noticing a lot of artists actually in the past 
there's a there's a history of thinking about being the medium that that art authorship is like being a medium for something else mm -hmm. and it goes back even like to ancient Greeks like in the muse like I'm being moved by the muses I'm not really creating myself mm -hmm. Um, or the Bible, the yeah. apostles believed that God spoke through them and they wrote this. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, you also you you wrote about this idea of the artist as a tool among tools, and, and so something that in a way someone that enables even I guess mm, it's what you're doing with your character and you're sort of a medium for these characters to come out mm. and so thinking about personhood as a medium and as a as something that can as a way um, help this consciousness to come out from yeah, yeah create a sort of consciousness in something else that is beyond the person who yeah I think I have this one work that I did once and it was during a period of being very unproductive. I was pretty annoyed with myself. I hadn't done any work. And I noticed, I, I made this one video that I think kind of led me to do this PhD and think more about mm -hmm. what is happening in my videos. And it was a video in which uh, I am basically being inhabited by this almost robot-like character, almost AI-like character mm -hmm. and she's actually talking about the experience of being in my body so mm -hmm. she's like oh gosh it's really strange I feel like I'm in some I'm in this body I can feel sensations and you, you you're hearing this character waking up in my body and where have I gone I'm not there and then the character's sort of talking starting to get anxious because she knows as soon as I stop performing, she disappears and I'm back. So that um, led me to think about being a medium mm -hmm. for characters and medium in the sense of like mediums who talk to ghosts, you know, mm -hmm. like who hold seances. And I'm very interested in how a medium basically needs to be, as, uh, as we were saying earlier, something without a character. Mm -hmm. Like you need to be um, flat, a surface upon which some other agency can manifest itself. So T.S. Eliot as well, the poet, mm -hmm. wrote about, um, become. he said the best poetry comes from it, like getting rid of your personality and becoming like a conduit. So yeah, there's a bit of history of those ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, how does this relate to artificial intelligence? You mentioned also artificial intelligence, and I know it's something that you're mm. really exploring also in your practice so, and your PhD. So. I think what's great, um, well, not great, <laughs> I think what's kind of really timely maybe about AI, I mean, there's loads of discussions we can have about AI, obviously, um, that are very topical for now, but being someone who's maybe interested in philosophy and philosophy of self, I really am interested in how AI is going to challenge what we think we are, um, and it's already doing that. Um, for example, I often hear, you know, panel conversations where some someone is saying, "Yeah, AI can perform magnificent feats. It can look like it's being creative, but it's not really creative." Mm -hmm. So it looks like it wrote a, a story, mm -hmm. but it's not, re it's not aware. And I'm starting to wonder whether we are actually do, it's, it's almost like this assumption like we have some extra chemical, like secret ingredient mm -hmm. that makes us different to AI. And I wonder as AI progresses, whether we will start to see a smaller and smaller difference and to see the surprising simplicity that's behind so certain things like being creative, which we thought would always be a human-only domain. Mm -hmm. It turns out, for example, that AI, if you want to teach it to, if you want to teach it, do machine learning and teach an AI to cr create some original piece of writing or an original image mm -hmm. or an original piece of music, 
what you do is you train it on loads of literature, mm -hmm. loads of images, or loads of music. And in a way, it's exactly what I'm doing in my practice as well. I'm getting lots and lots of input, mm -hmm. and in a way, I'm looking, I think we do work, and creativity, I think it is very statistical in a way, mm -hmm. that we seek as artists for patterns on different levels, and then we copy them in new combinations. Mm -hmm. So there is a link actually between um, what's happening with AI now and theories of authorship mm -hmm. that came with like Roland Barthes and the death of the author. And Roland Barthes is saying like um, in his essay, this idea that there's no such thing as originality. Mm -hmm. You only rehash the whatever was there before you, but in new combinations, and that is originality. That is creativity. Mm -hmm. That's how AI works, actually, or like how machine learning mm -hmm. uh, models that create original stuff work as well. So there are some similarities, and I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I was really interested in um, a parallel between the stream of consciousness and the text generated by artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like try and take a text from like um, the Molly Bloom's monologue and see what happens if you put this a few words or the entire dialogue into an algorithm that can recreate a different text and mm -hmm. see if like something that is so strictly related to consciousness as the stream of consciousness could actually be taken for uh, a generated text or conversely if like a generated text could like the exchange for the original mm -hmm. novel in a way that was something I was curious about and I was discussing this with an artist but yeah so there is this kind of scripted you also mm -hmm. mentioned like the genoma of each of us and I think mm -hmm. also in suburbia you mm -hmm. talk a lot about this yeah exactly this is a really good connections um, yeah, so actually my, my PhD project is called Scripting for Agency. Mm -hmm. I think we often think intuitively that scripting and agency are opposites. So what I mean is, for example, um, we tend to associate spontaneity uh, with freedom and being scripted or following instructions mm -hmm. as imprisonment or like lack of freedom mm -hmm. and I guess this project is kind of questioning that as well or like my work is sort of questioning for example we often use the word determinate if we live in a determinate system we can't be free because everything is predetermined that's kind of what a script is it, it says in advance everything that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Do this, do this, do this next. If that happens, do that. If that happens, do that. I'm interested in the kind of scripts, though, which do exist in nature, mm -hmm. and maybe in AI soon, and maybe we're an example of that. Mm -hmm. Scripts which give rise to surprising outcomes. So I think um, I'm interested in theories of emergence, where you have like an apparently simple scripted seems really like fascistic <laughs> it's, it's 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 very controlled mm -hmm. but on some other level it can give rise to something autonomous so an example is um, like we are scripted by mm. DNA so you could get twins for example who have the same genetic script mm -hmm. and then you run them in the real world and they start going in separate ways <laughs> you know mm -hmm and doing surprising things. Um, yeah, it's also this parallel between the figure of the artist and the scientist that mm -hmm. you mentioned. You said you're really also into science in a way. Mm -hmm. and so it goes back to the idea of the impartiality of, in a way of the... Uh, of a... Uh, how did I say this? Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, what, do you, what do you think would happen if I think this is an experiment you uh, also mm -hmm. plan to do, like uh, having someone else playing a text of yours or mm -hmm. a character you create. I don't know what. Yeah. How this can affect 
also in a way people's mind and behavior and mm. I guess my yeah. hope uh, I think you're right I think in a way this kind of the thoughts I'm having it can lead in many directions mm -hmm. you can try some of the things I've done in new configurations mm -hmm. in, um, one of the things I did for example is a project called a ritual resuscitation of eternal lovers it's a long title I <laughs> know <Yeah>. but um, <laughs> It's actually a play script, and I did write it for other people, so not for me. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's a, it's a text between two people in love, their lovers, called Rosa and Lawrence. But they are actually aware that they are stuck in a script. Mm -hmm. And so I give the, this kind of common thing I'm exploring. I give the script to two people. Often I actually ask couples, because mm -hmm. they might have that relationship that the characters have to each other as well and they when I'm filming them re doing the reading they have never read the text before mm -hmm. so as they're reading aloud they're going to start noticing the characters in the script are talking about them mm -hmm. they start saying oh I'm really grateful to this person who's reading for us Lawrence because it's been so long since we last spoke to each other I really miss you, but we don't have that long because this script usually lasts about 15 minutes. What are we going to do with our time together? Mm -hmm. And they have a conversation about what they're going to do with these 15 minutes they have together while the reader's reading. And obviously the reader then is also like starting to feel responsible for the characters. And often people tell me they feel sorry for the characters because as they go through the text, they're getting closer and closer to the tech, to the characters becoming unconscious again, you know. So that's an example where mm. I was scripting, uh, f and and the idea is that other people run it, and this is imagining people like computers mm -hmm. running my program, mm -hmm. um, and the idea with this work is it should be repeated many many times, and then to see the car these lovers c flashing back into consciousness mm -hmm. in little fragments and it's it's trying to basically do a, a Frankenstein thing of <laughs> pumping life into mm -hmm. something that is not yet living yeah and I feel very like close to that work mm -hmm. it's going to be performed actually um, if you're interested at the South London mm -hmm. Gallery uh, on the 19th of February mm -hmm. so it's not out okay. yet but um, and then I ask volunteers in the audience if they want to read, so if you're there, you can do the reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just going back to the dominant character, who's writing this letter? That's a really good question. I mean, this is for <laughs> you, right? I mean, it's, yeah, I can explain. Um, this is a new experiment, this text. It's a letter to me the, the character I'm being now. So, um, if as you'll see when you read the text, I it's almost like I asked one of my characters to write me a letter, and I didn't know what was going to come out. Mm -hmm. It turned out you can see at the end of the letter. Yeah. What is it? Can you read like the last two lines or something? Tough luck. Yeah, tough luck. You stumbled on a cynical one. Better luck getting someone else to write your damn letter next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect that, actually. I honestly... T I, it's exactly stumbling upon. Mm -hmm. I'll try this again, actually, and see who else may be someone more sympathetic to me. It's uh, funny, because I asked you for... You told me that you were going to send me a text. And so I asked you about this text, and you said, oh, I don't think I'm going to write it in the end. And like after, I think, not even one day, you sent it to me. I was like, what, <laughs> what happened in the meantime? Like, and so, yeah, and you also said that maybe our conversation could be a letter to the dominant character. So I was wondering in which way you think, like, I don't think I said that, but that's a really interesting oh, idea. Really? Oh, really? <laughs> I, I think... I think I was interested in even watching our characters play out in this situation. Because oh. <laughs> we're also performing a kind of dance right now. And it's nice. It's not actually 
disingenuous, even though we're in a sense role playing. Mm -hmm. And I like watching. So I think there's, yeah, there's some similarity there. But what you're saying sounds kind of interesting, like to that we are writing a letter now. But I would say I am a dominant character now. Because I was also wondering, uh, when you asked me to be here, I was also wondering if, if, if I was kind of being asked to be part of a performance in a way, mm. or mm -hmm. an actual like conversation. I was like, oh. <laughs> now I, after, especially after watching all the video, I was like, so she's recording it. I don't know if. Is this another kind of performance or an actual conversation? Or maybe there's no difference in, in the end. But I don't know, maybe I'll come to the South London Gallery and I will see myself in a video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's a really interesting point. I think that's kind of a boundary I'm actively exploring. Mm -hmm. I did mean just a genuine conversation, <laughs> just you and me having a chat. But um, I think there is some... I think you can maybe feel some of the acting involved, but it's also, I think it's a kind of, when people communicate, it's often a mm -hmm. kind of generous acting. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm moving my hands extra to be yeah. understood, to, to help you understand what I mean. So we, we, we act for each other, mm -hmm. to help each other understand and stay on the same wavelength. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was meant genuinely, but we could s see now that we're talking so much about performance, we can kind of maybe see it taking place. Yeah. yeah. Those are um. good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you want to... Um, yeah, I have a weird question. Video. So, yeah, weird. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned that you, uh, you, 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 were, you ha uh, have been asked that uh, are you faking your accent? Are mm -hmm. you faking like uh, as another character when you? But yeah, you didn't realize it. So mm -hmm. I, I I would like to know what was your answer and mm -hmm. what will you answer now? Like yeah. after all this research and you know practices. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I think um, am I faking it? I think it's almost like. I, I really feel a necessity now to move beyond this dichotomy of fake or not fake. I think that's what I discovered for myself, at least in my practice, that these, these designations are not adequate somehow. So for, um, I can, it, I, in a way, one way of thinking about it, for example, is communication in a way is always a form of manipulation. It could be a good-natured one, good-intentioned one, but I'm trying to move your mind in some direction when I'm talking to you, um, even if it's to help, to be kind. So it's in a way, I'm always, it's a striving. Communication is always a striving. I'm reaching out mm -hmm. to you and trying to... Um, get something across so I feel like in the most genuine and authentic encounters there is acting involved and that that's that we maybe need more nuanced thinking around authenticity and performance that's what I'm thinking is if that's not too much of a, a cop-out question it will you know I think you sometimes get to these points where you the question is is it this or this and then you start to feel, oh, the whole question is somehow wrong. I need to go some, somehow paint a new picture where that question doesn't ma um, hold anymore. But one example, I get, to not be too abstract, one example I like to give is, you know, about the flat, uh, flat earth and round earth. So uh, in the old days, people used to argue, oh, is the world infinite? Or is it finite? Mm -hmm. And they're worrying about this because if I'm in a ship, what if I fall off? I don't realize I met the edge of the world. So people are arguing, is the world finite or infinite? And then it turns out that whole question and these two choices are based on one image of the world, that it is flat. 
if you have an image of the world where it's round, it's in a way both finite and infinite. It's finite because it's not infinitely big, and it's infinite because you could go round and round forever on it. So this is, I think, my answer to your question. By changing the whole shape of the world, the whole question, is it finite or finite, sort of, those were not the right words, actually. Mm -hmm. That was not the right question. So I, I haven't articulated it yet, but I feel, am I being fake or not, is a question like, is it finite or infinite? Like, if I have a new shape of a person in my head, then some other question will become relevant. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. awesome. <laughs> And, and I think I, I can totally feel that in your work too. Uh, like based on <laughs> your discussion, because I haven't seen yet. Um, like the the performance you just mentioned, like as uh, a couple to read your script, mm -hmm. and but blending the others and self, like all the concept in, in the same script is so fascinating. Like yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um, if ever ever anyone wants to do the reading, I sometimes like to set one up. If you want to do it with a friend. I'll come and like record you, or it can be not recorded. But I like sometimes I do it in a theatrical setting. But I like actually going to people's houses <laughs> and just like on their sofa yeah. with a friend or their partner. Um, so yeah, if you want, you can if you want to read it, yeah. you can get in touch with me yeah. for us. <laughs> we should do it. Yeah, maybe yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I um, because you said. Um, in Western culture, uh, like they they are not very mm -hmm. appreciate the, the like uh, change multi identity uh, mm -hmm. um, of uh, inconsistency. Yeah, yeah. inconsistency. Um, and you you like to uh, change to say change. So how would you like to contribute? Mm. Like in terms of like you using your practice, your work. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think different artists have different uh, stances on how, to, what, how art functions politically. Um, for me, I think a really good function of an artist in politics is to raise questions. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if I'm actually the right person to necessarily give the answers on these things, but I would love to make them conspicuous so that other people can maybe decide or, or have conversations about it. So I always liked how an artwork, for me, my favorite artwork sort of, we were talking about this the other day. Well, um, last night. Yeah, last oh, night, yeah. yeah. <laughs> last night, late into the night, yeah. we were talking about how we really like artworks that pinpoint something kind of nameless mm. and something that maybe people don't really notice, that you can sort of tease it into articulation, mm -hmm. and you as the artist maybe don't have the answers about that or the philosophy for that, but that's your contribution. You give it to humanity to then talk about that thing. Yeah. Um, it has a name now or it has some aesthetic now that you can grasp, so that's one way of answering that. I'm not sure yet. It's, some kind of, it's a kind of dialogue I'd really like to have with fellow humans yeah but for me like because um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from China Guangzhou mm -hmm. and but uh, I also spent seven years in, in Japan mm -hmm. and now I'm in London so I, I, I also have like this kind of like yeah. uh, confu confused confusion yeah. of identity and so I, I and I after I came here I feel like everyone is so you know so um, how to say, I uh, proud of their identity mm -hmm. and, and really fix and mm -hmm. I kind of feel I, I totally feel that violent you, you just mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. and and but for their like for the some some like for the stride and and some some of the you know political reason mm -hmm. they they need to do that right yeah so yeah. I, I I was thinking but what about like us, like without really fixed identity. So I, I kind of consider you as, um, you know, <laughs> re re represent. <laughs> like maybe oh, one of the, yeah. And I also think uh, this kind of um, practice is a very good way to, to rethink the input and output in, in ourselves. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think you mentioned something interesting there, that there may, maybe it's possible that there have been moments in history where it's been politically necessary to unite under a banner. And I mean, one of the examples I'm thinking of is how, like in Britain in like the 80s, people of color kind of united under the name black. Mm -hmm. Like Indian people, Pakistani people. And it, it kind of served a purpose like according to René de Lodge, as a kind of uniting, um, a way to unite on common issues. And so I hear that as well, that sometimes labels have been forces of empowerment as well, mm -hmm. especially for marginalized people, or people who are marginalized along some factors. Um, but it's, that's why this issue is a bit tricky, because um, I also think it can be you know, there is something going on in culture at the moment, at least around here, um, in the in the Anglo Anglophone countries of um, really like trying to categorize to a T, like all of what we are and kind of summarize it. And there's some violence involved in that. So it's a tricky question. Like, is mm. it maybe sometimes necessary or good to have labels? Um, and is it sometimes really important to emphasize fluidity? Uh, maybe those things don't have to be at odds as well, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's, it's a tricky one. <laughs> we also think all of your characters are labeled in different way, even just by the, your title, the title you give to your video, like Homo Horizontalis or... Mm. Uh, so in a way, they are all labeled, but they are many. So it's like mm. there's still a complexity, and I don't know. In a way, they are defined, and that's another interesting thing. Mm. What if these characters also could be vehicle for other characters, or mm. what if mm. these characters evolved mm. after coming out a few times, maybe? you could decide that like they could actually change and evolve in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe the title you decided to give could be could change as well, it could be another one. Like maybe Homo Horizontalis decide to just stand up and yeah. <laughs> go back to uh, verticality. So in that case you wouldn't call this person Homo Horizontalis anymore, but it would be I don't know, that's interesting yeah. as well. How that they could have a life in a way. Yeah, they could have a life, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not being labelled by their character. How can I explain? Oh, that's really, yeah, that's got me thinking now, yeah. I think in general I'm playing with the idea of evolving characters, as you say, so mm. maybe repeating some of them. Uh, so far I just haven't been very good at it. Mm. Um, but so, so far for some reason I'm always from scratch a new one, mm -hmm. um, but um, maybe intentionally repeating some of them and seeing what they would do on another day mm -hmm. is another worthy experiment, seeing if they changed in some way. I don't know how often like, each character come out, like if it's something that, I don't know, happen frequently or rather not so often and you prefer to like let someone else come out rather than someone that already spoke, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just, I find it fun to see mm -hmm. who's going to come out today. Because then they are also <laughs> pissed off, like saying, oh, you didn't kind of, <laughs> yeah. you never let me talk or something. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, like, also they are in conflict with you more than um, how you're actually in conflict with them. I mean, it's more like them struggling rather than you struggling because there are so many people wanting to speak. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, that's why so far I had this idea of a dominance. Like, I, I decide when they speak and when they don't speak. And, so um, you are the dictator? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's but no thing of <laughs> I was just talking to this with Danny earlier that... Um, um, maybe I'm moving a little bit away from the dominant and subordinate because, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a new, a new idea I have is calling these characters tangential, mm -hmm. and the character I'm playing now is tethered, like tied to something, and I think 
basically the idea in my thesis is going to be there's a difference mm -hmm. between the social agent and the human being. What do I mean by that? Uh, the social agent is the person or the character that acts on your behalf, that is kind of the stakeholder in society, that is taking responsibility for all the things you do, good and bad, taking the credit and responsibility. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that character is important and empowered because it um, gets all the benefits of being the representative of the human being, but it's also burdened with responsibilities. So when I go to jail for doing something bad, it will be that character that goes to jail. These other ones are still sort of untethered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I th and then the human being, I think, is more some, some kind of machine that can play out different characters. So one of the kind of ideas I have, again, speculative, is maybe we don't go far enough with our ideas about diversity. Mm -hmm. So currently, we're really good at talking about diversity on a social level. Like, we need different kinds of people. And that's, that's really true, because your, your society is so impoverished if you lack this whole perspective mm -hmm. by not including these people. That's bad for everyone. That's not just bad for the people who are being marginalized. That's bad for the dominant people as well. They miss out on all that perspective that could have been so valuable. So we're really developed now at talking about diversity in society, but I wonder if we actually stop at the level of the social agent, this representative that's mm -hmm. acting for us. Maybe we could go further with diversity and apply it to ourselves and thinking about how can I cultivate the diversity of myself? Um, and so th these I, I started thinking about maybe politics, actually. The politics of diversity could start with the self, in a way, um, and appreciating this difference. There's the me that acts in, on behalf of, as a representative. It's an important character. But there's also, it's, it would be a reduction of me to just kind of assume those two things are the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my current where I'm going with the thesis as a proposition for then other people to talk about and maybe mm. prove me wrong or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But maybe, I don't know if I've... I want to leave time for you guys maybe to have a watch of the film. Oh, yeah, yeah, I really don't know what time is what it. What time? Like it's ten past seven. Um, oh, okay. really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> if there's... Really does anyone have any sort of last minute things or do you Clara wanna um, is there anything can I ask your friend did, did you guys notice the differences like um, like from yesterday last night <laughs> no. <laughs> like, no yesterday yeah. completely psycho <laughs> 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 no no um, like I'm, 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 I've been familiar with her um, work like for a long time so um, I'm quite familiar with like the different characters like, I was talking to you just before this about I just clearly remember the fur coat woman I love that <laughs> like right, well, she was Russian right well, she had a yeah Russian. yeah yeah like, I just remember that one for you did that years I think you must have done that like in 2014 that one yeah oh, yeah. 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 yeah why why you lock her up <laughs> why was why why did you lock her up? Why did I lock her up? Actually, she does come back. She does oh, come yeah. back. Yeah. But there's always <laughs> slight differences. Just like if I'm different to who I was six years ago. Ah, so true. it's almost like she also is kind of different as well. Someone's trying to get in the building. Oh, <laughs> I think. oh I can lock them in. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> just check. Yeah, so those are really good questions. I'm really grateful to you all for, um, yeah. <laughs> Do you see me, am I different to how I was in the flat yesterday? Oh, um, only slightly. Well, maybe not. But I mean, like, it's kind of the small things, right? People's mannerisms, which, you know, mm. they do change as well. So, yeah. But I think, like you were saying, like, everyone kind of does that to a certain extent anyway. Yeah. So... Do you know what I mean? Like it's just you're mm -hmm. kind of like 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 exaggerating it or you know, like making it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody does it. 
to a certain extent. You know? yes. You kind of have to, really, because, uh, yeah. you know, like every, everyone would be fighting way too much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I think that's kind of this subconscious, like, smoothing over of society, you know, everyone can just, you know, kind of get along to a certain extent. But. And, you know, like, when you bring two s different friend circles, mm. and yeah. it gets awkward, because <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you don't know yeah. who to be. <laughs> That's why I, I never totally brought understand. anyone in Italy. I mean, when I lived in Milan, all my friends in Milan and my boyfriend was in Mil were in Milan, and I didn't, never want to bring them to like Rome with my family and everything. They were two separate. Well, then how, how do you get along with her? her. <laughs> yeah, this is different because she's here. I'm ah. not joking. But yeah. So you already meet meet the um, London, 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 London yeah. crowd. <laughs> yes, we just met London. Okay. But yeah, it's also that every time I, why, when I'm talking to someone and I, can, I have this feeling that I'm kind of, the perception that I am acting and I'm not behaving like necessarily as I would in another situation, I also feel that I have to s suppress this mm -hmm. thing rather than embrace it and just playing with it. And I would like to do that more. But yeah, as you said, probably, I don't know if you do this also, if you sometimes, if it's something that you do just in front of the camera where it's, when it's no one's watching, or if it's, mm -hmm. it's something that maybe with people you don't really know, like when you are at the supermarket or whatever, <laughs> when you don't really care about the actually mm, being recognized in a way, it's something you also mm. do. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's mostly, I do do it off camera sometimes, but mostly with myself. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I just feel maybe, I, w I am, I worry about being mean. <laughs> like, I don't want to really mislead <laughs> someone. So this means that you, sometimes you have the feeling that some characters are coming out, but you stop them, like. Oh no, so like, you mean like. If it feels like an actual, part of me that wants to come into expression, I will let it, um, mm -hmm. definitely. So sometimes I even notice I'm dropping into more of this accent and I will go more in that direction because it feels like the right me to be. Mm. Um, but one thing I do, for example, when I'm reading a text that I don't really, like, you know, in academia and stuff, we read texts sometimes that we find difficult. Yeah. I have noticed... <laughs> the <moment. laughs> um, I notice, like... Sometimes I'll read it aloud in another accent, and I'll read it as someone who I think sounds really intellectual, ah. and then I understand it better, because I sound like Susan Hiller or something, <laughs> and then I feel like, oh, I, I can get into this text now. So I use it as a kind of life helper, like help helps mm. in my life to be in character. But this character is also speaking, speaking your mind, or this doesn't happen like that maybe you just uh-huh like are thinking like they're thinking inside you in a way like mm -hmm. that you say if you think like oh this is what this character would think now like yeah so i'm not entirely sure i think maybe some effort is actually involved mm -hmm. i think it, i'm i am claiming that there is a kind of natural bandwidth that where you do frame switch and it comes naturally the things I'm doing in my practice takes a bit of effort, I suppose, because I'm trying to even sort of push the boundary of my spectrum, if that makes sense. So it isn't always... The, the kinds of characters I explore in my practice are not the most natural, mm -hmm. but I suppose I'm interested in how far can I push not being myself and still feeling kind of comfortable and um, mm -hmm. like I can just be in the world like that. So... Um, did that answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, yes, yeah. As you said, sometimes you're on yourself alone and just play out characters. That means that it's not necessarily something that comes out when you are in front of people, that you don't just act when you are in front of others, but it's something that also for yourself. I mean, also when I'm on my own, probably in my room, it's easier for me to just play out different characters. Yeah. That this means that it's not necessarily related to the necessity of acting when mm -hmm. you are with others, but even something that comes naturally in a way in some certain situation. 
him? Yeah, I think the nature is quite different. So when I do it on my own, it's a lot more like, you know, when you talk to yourself when you are cooking and stuff, I'm like, right, now I'm going to put some of this and then I'm going to do some of that and cut it this way. So mm. when I'm on my own, it's more like, sounds a bit like unconscious kind of stream of consciousness sort of thing. And when there's a camera, it becomes a lot more theatrical mm. than like a camera. I think it's like a, like theatre. I think it's something to do with, for example, right now, I'm putting way more effort, I'm probably spending more calories uh, talking to you and like, yeah. then if I was sitting at home, it's kind of like that phenomenon, you know when you're watching a funny film on your own, you don't laugh aloud, but when you're watching it with a friend, then you laugh aloud, because you almost want to put more effort into signaling your inner life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... I think it's like that. When there's a camera, I start to put more effort because mm -hmm. I feel the witness with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. I think we can just watch maybe the watch a final little yeah. screening. Do you guys maybe want a break? Do you want there's yeah. a there's a toilet all the way downstairs if you need to go. Uh, otherwise, I can just. Press play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Very interesting. <laughs>